Jesus said that he would die and rise up in three days. He didn't need a monument to mark his resting place. When Calvary's crucifixion hours at last were finally through, they put his broken body in somebody else's tomb. He didn't use it for long. That old grave made of stone For it only took three days And Jesus walked out all alone Arising victorious Like he said he would do That is why the Savior Only borrowed the tomb Satan was defeated there the power of death denied for nothing on this earth could ever hold the king inside he broke the bonds of hell and left behind an empty room and still today nobody is inside that borrowed tomb he didn't use it for long that old grave made of stone for it only took three Like he said he would do That is why the Savior only borrowed the tomb He lives, he lives, Jesus lives today The sting of death forever gone God's children now can say We can say Aren't you glad he lives today? Would you take your Bible with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's go there together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Begin reading verse 1 in just a minute. There was a preacher in a small town, a little church there, and they had put up some really nice decorations. He was really pleased for Easter. And he said to the children there in the church, Do you notice something different this morning? They looked around, and one girl spoke up. Yeah, it's full. <laughs> Church is full. <laughs> I'm glad you're here this morning, and I'm glad you came and chose to come today. We praise the Lord for that. Well, we have some people here. We have some people, of course, in Chelsea helping there, and I'm glad uh, for all of that that's going on. But I'm glad you've chosen to be with us, and I trust the Word of God to be a blessing as we preach it. You know, Corinth was a Greek city. Corinth was a city. So we go to 1 Corinthians. This is a letter written by Paul the Apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, back to Corinth. And they were people that did not believe in the resurrection. And they had lots of theories about death, but they did not believe in the resurrection. And so at Athens, even when Paul preached, you remember in Acts 17 there in Mars Hill, verse 32, it says they mocked when he spoke of the resurrection. They laughed at him. And most Greek philosophers actually consider the human body to be a prison. And you are in bondage. And they welcomed death as a deliverance from bondage. And Paul, of course, here is writing this letter back to the church of Corinth, answering questions. There was a church that had lots of problems and issues and disputes in the church. And so he's helping them here as he talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Let's begin reading there. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, 
which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. I bring you a message this morning entitled, Resurrection Proofs. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we've come this morning happy, grateful, not just that Jesus lives, but that He came and He died on the cross for our sin, and took all the sin of all the world, believers and non-believers, past, present, future, heaped upon the back of our Savior, and in love, he took our place in death, in hell, in the grave. But thank God He didn't stay there. We thank You and praise You that He lives. He is victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And because of that, He can be our Savior. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Help us now as we look into it. May the Holy Spirit of God do the work that only He can do in our hearts. And we'll thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. We see resurrection proofs of the gospel truth this morning. Let me ask you, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is not the Ten Commandments. The gospel is not the Sermon on the Mount. The gospel are facts about a person. The person is the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These facts that He died for our sins. He was buried and He rose again, according to the Scriptures. That's the Gospel. See, the Gospel does not tell us something that we must do. It tells us something that He has already done for us. That's the Gospel. The good news. What Jesus has done for us. I want to see three proofs this morning. First of all, the first proof we find in verse 1 and 2 is salvation. Salvation. Paul had come to them... We see in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Talking about when he was there in Corinth. When he led them to the faith in Jesus Christ when he planted that church. Which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. And to this day you stand as a church because you received the gospel that I preached to you. And notice verse 2, By which also ye are saved. Salvation is the first proof of the gospel. The church is the first proof of the gospel. Paul had shared the gospel with these people. People that worshipped idols. Uh, people that had been... Uh, Greek, Greek mythology, they were stooped with just idols and they were so superstitious on Mars Hill. Paul said, you guys have a God to everything. And they even had a God to a, a statue that said to the unknown God, in case they had forgotten one, they did not want to anger that God. They were superstitious but he introduced them to the one and only true God, the God of the Bible, the creator of heaven and earth. He introduced them to them, to him, and they got saved. Their lives were changed. If you read the book of Corinthians, uh, what they came from, he tells them all these gross sins, and then he says, such were some of you. But their life had been changed. The miracle found in the gospel, in the first proof of the, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is how he's changed you. How He's come into a life and every one of us could raise our hand and say, I know someone. They were wicked. Maybe you were that someone. But I mean, their life were all sinners, but their life was maybe like the Sunday school lesson this morning. They, they were known as a sinner. But Jesus, when they met Jesus, He changed their life. It's unexplainable. Now, they tried everything else, but when they came to know Jesus as their Savior, it made all the difference. 
See, millions upon millions of people over the last 20 centuries have believed the truth that we believe, that Christ is alive. He's alive. You, can't, you simply cannot explain the church apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't do it. He's alive. After all, a dead Savior can't save anyone. But He is alive. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Word tells us. That's our hope. Do you know He lives in you this morning? Uh, do you know if you were to die where you sit, if you were to die ten years from now, do you know you'd be in heaven with Him? I talked to two men yesterday. They didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I talked to them about being a sinner. They believed that. Uh, they even uh, gave at least some degree of thought and a belief to a hell. But they did not believe that Jesus was alive that He had rose from the grave. He is living Savior. Well, I'll tell you what I know. I know when I was introduced to the Lord Jesus. As an eight-year-old boy, someone introduced Jesus to me. I knew I was a sinner. And I knew that I deserved hell because of my sin, but they introduced me to a living Savior, the Lord Jesus. Eight-year-olds don't really play games like this. They don't put on, you know. They're real. That's one thing beautiful about children. They're, they're, they're real. What they are, what you see is what you get, you know. Uh, they don't put on this facade that we adults get so good at sometimes, right? We put on this exterior that looks really good, but the motive on the inside often is not the same. I hope that's not the case with you, but we all know what I mean. But as an eight-year-old boy, I just took God at His Word, and I asked the Lord Jesus to forgive my sin, recognize that without Him I'd go to hell, and I asked Him to come into my heart to save me, and He came in. He changed my life from that point forward. I didn't feel weird all over. I didn't see any 900-foot Jesus or something crazy like that. Just what the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And just like Jesus promised, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me, fellowship with him. I will come in. And I just opened my door to him. And he came in. He's changed my life. You can't explain the rest of my life apart from a living Savior. I'm not holding to some creed. I am in a relationship with a person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I talked to Him today. And if you know the Lord Jesus is your Savior, He speaks to you, doesn't He? He talks to you. He is at work in your life. He promised being confident of this very thing that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And He's at work in our hearts now. See, salvation is the first proof. And Paul here says, listen, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's first proved in your own selves. Look what God has done in your lives. You're saved, and you stand today in that church because of the Lord Jesus who saved you. The second proof we see in verse 3 and 4, the Scriptures. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We see, first of all, that He died. No shocker there. Millions of people that could be said about. He died. All the great people of the past and history that we would look at, that epitaph could be wrote about their life to be written, he died. He died. In fact, some died victorious, some died in terror. D.L. Moody, he died as he lived, bursting with eagerness to experience more of Christ, and he died saying, this is my coronation day, as he went to heaven. Amen. Voltaire, the aggressive atheist, died in stark fear. In fact, his nurse said, I will never, for no amount of money in the world, never be at the deathbed of an atheist again. It was so terrifying 
as he died. See, there's nothing unusual about the statement, he died. Adam and Eve died. Cain and Abel died. Methuselah lived 969 years, but he died. You can go through any graveyard anywhere and find the truth that's universal, that it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. He died. Noah died. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they died. Joseph died. David and Daniel, they died. Moses died. The Pharaoh that lived in Moses' time when he was a baby that planned the first Jewish holocaust, he died. Alexander the Great died, weeping because there were no more worlds to conquer, though he, the man who had never learned to conquer himself, he died. In fact, at his request, he said, bury me and parade me through the streets with my hands open, showing everybody that I took nothing with me. He died. Julius Caesar died. Wicked Tiberius, whose reign Jesus was crucified under, he died. Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, that were busy, busy, busy turning the Jews to reject Christ, they died. Pilate, who signed his death warrant, he died. Nothing remarkable about the fact that he died. But I want you to notice verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15 here. For I delivered unto you first of all, by the way, that word first of all, that phrase means of first importance. This is the important thing in the Word of God. Lots of important things, but this is the first important how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. See, the difference is Jesus Christ died according to the Scriptures. As He hung there on the tree, in His mind, as God, He went back through all the Scriptures of the Old Testament that prophesied about Jesus, the Messiah, how He would die, and He realized as He went through all of them, He checked them off one by one, that He had accomplished, and He said... It is finished. The word finished there doesn't just mean completed. It actually means perfected. It was the word they would use when they would take a little lamb to the sacrifice that was of no spot or blemish, and they would use that same word, perfected. Perfect. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies about the Messiah. Here's just a few it was prophesied that he would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41.9 says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread as he handed Judas the bread that night before he was crucified, hath lifted up his heel against me. It was told that he would be crucified back in Psalm 22.16. That was before crucifixion was even something that was used. It wasn't in vogue there, it wasn't popular at all then, but it was prophesied that he would be pierced in the hands and feet. It was foretold that he would be given vinegar and gall to drink, Psalm 69, 21. It was prophesied that no bone of his body would be broken, yet when they crucified, they would always come by, because a strong man could go several days on the cross. They'd come by and break their legs finally, where they could no longer push up to get air any longer. But it was prophesied that no bone of his would be broken, because they did not take his life. He laid it down. He gave his life. They were shocked that he was dead already. It was foretold that he would be with the rich in his death, Isaiah 53, 9. He was buried in the rich man's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus took him. What is so extraordinary about the death of Christ is that he died according to the Scriptures. Just as it was foretold by many different prophets over 4,000 or so years prior, happened just like it was said. It would happen. It's amazing to what lengths people will go to avoid the truth about Christ. It's like evolution creation. No one was there when this world began. No one. No one. But they want to believe a big bang and some uh, cataclysmic thing happened and put, if you've looked at the stars, if you've looked at our planets, if you've looked at the intricacies of creation in, a, in just a little bug or the miracle of birth, you know we didn't come from monkeys and it didn't happen by accident. But it takes more faith or just as much to believe in that as it does to believe that a God, Jehovah God, created heaven and earth. People go to such lengths 
In fact, there's a theory that Jesus didn't really die. He swooned. Uh, that's another word for he fainted. Well, in order for that theory to be true, that he fainted and in, in the coolness of a cave in the tomb, he revived back to life. He was just out, unconscious, in a shallow, breathing state. In order for that to be true, you have to believe that the Roman soldiers that did this all the time did not know death when they saw it. Uh, you'd have to believe that the centurion charged with putting this man to death could not tell the difference between a man that fainted and a man that was dead. And in order for this to be true, the people that stood by, the witnesses that said, he's dead already, they were wrong. In order for that to be true, the Sanhedrin that had moved heaven and earth to put this man to death didn't stay to make sure the job was finished. See, no one in history questions that he died. That's not the question. It's a fact that he lived and he died. No one doubts that. Uh, the doubt they have is that he was the Messiah and that he is alive today. But in order for that theory to be true when the man came by and they didn't break his legs because he was dead already and the, so just to be sure they, that he didn't swoon, they stuck a spear and from the angle they would have stuck it up in his side there, it would have went right up into his heart. That's how they did it. And he yet still revived. In order for that to be true, once he got in the tomb, normally their bones were all out of joint from the weight of their body and going up and down. He would have had to come out of this cast. And by the way, his followers would have had to have been tricked as well that took him and put him in this cast. The way they did the bandages and the sticky spices, it would form into almost a, a, a custom coffin around the body. It would harden like a cast. And he would have done some type of Houdini trick to get out of that, plus put them back the way they were. But then beyond that, he'd had to roll back the stone, which Mark 16, the ladies that were coming to put spices more on the body were worried who was going to move the stone for them because them together, they didn't know if they could move the great stone in front of the tomb. Not only that, he would have had to slip by the Roman guard that was charged with the seal to guard and keep it. You see, then this man who, no one questions that he was an honorable man, the most honest man, would have then had to three days later lie and say he had died and was alive from the grave and for 40 days continue that lie. You see how soon it gets to be ridiculous when people won't take God at His word because the truth is He died and came out of the grave through the stone. They didn't open it for Him. He came out and He's alive forevermore. He arose. A woman wrote J. Vernon McGee, the great Bible teacher through the Bible, said, our preacher said that on Easter, Jesus just swooned on the cross. It's a liberal idea. And the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? McGee replied, dear sister, beat your preacher with a leather whip for 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him in an airless tomb for three days, then see what happens. That was his response. From the cross, they go to the cemetery. Verse 5, he was buried. The Bible says, and that, or verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was buried. Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus took him. Joseph and Nicodemus were both members of the Sanhedrin that were against this plot to kill Jesus and stop him. And they begged the body of Jesus and took him to Joseph's tomb, a rich man's tomb. I've been to that garden tomb. It was a round stone that's in a groove that would be rolled back, very large. They didn't have tombs like that unless you were very wealthy. But they put him in that tomb. They laid him there, and then they would have sealed it up. They put the imperial seal of Rome on that and set a 24-hour watch so no man could disrupt it for the next three days because they knew what he had promised. From the cross, we go to the cemetery, then to the calendar. Look at verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. The third day. God had circled on his calendar in heaven before time ever began this day. The day that the redemption of all mankind would take place. 
before sin and the iniquity had ever began in this world, God knew this day. His day of His birth was planned and circled. The day of His baptism was circled. The day of His death, the day of His burial, but most of all and above all, the day of His resurrection. Up from the grave He rose. Jesus never took His eye off that date. All through His life He would say, Mine hour is not yet come. Mine hour is not yet come. They tried to kill Him many times. The Bible said He would pass through the crowd because His hour was not yet. But as it got closer and closer, and that day approached, he would talk more of it. Finally, he'd tell his men, look, don't worry, I'm going to Jerusalem to be crucified, but after three days, I will rise again. And finally, he would say, mine hour has come. And he was put to death, was buried. And then on that day, planned, when the Godhead and the Trinity got together, Godhead, which is the Trinity, got together, said, we will have a part in the redemption of mankind. What part they would play, he arose the day that they planned. He arose. Come back in your mind to a date in British history. A Sunday morning in 1815, the Battle of Waterloo had been fought and won. But the people of England still anxiously awaited the news of the battle. In fact, it was before electricity, before uh, any type of telegram, even radio. News was relayed by semaphore. It's the old flags waving. They'd wave news and tell things by the flag they raised and the way they flew it. The battle had been fought and the signal was sent, but it was interrupted by the fog, which was so common in that area. And the message that came through was simply, Wellington defeated. It was the worst of news. The country went into mourning. Napoleon would again be the master of Europe. The Napoleonic Wars would have to be refought. It was all a very dark day, but the next day the sky was cleared. And the full message was received, and it said, Wellington defeated Napoleon. On the day that Christ died, the disciples went into mourning. They were hiding in the upper room. The message that was received was terrible. Christ defeated. That was the word. After all that he had said, after all he had done, his foes nailed him to a wooden cross. Man had killed his, their maker, it seemed. Jesus was dead. Death reigned for three days and three nights. They mourned. Satan had triumphed. But then on the first day of the week, the full message was received. Christ defeated Satan. He is alive. He's alive. He arose from the grave. That was the full message of the cross. The good news had not altered with time. Revelation 1.18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. The Sanhedrin concocted another tale. This is told in the scriptures. They told the guards that were watching that the Bible said, when the angel appeared and rolled back the stone, not to let Jesus out, but to show that it was already empty, they fell as dead men when the earth quaked and they rolled back the stone there in Matthew. You find the gospel records, they said, tell people that while you slept, the disciples came and stole the body which is what they had feared. That's why they set the guard. That's why they sealed the tomb. Of course, for Roman soldiers to sleep on watch was a sentence of death, especially had what you were, guarded, what you were guarding been stolen. Can you imagine the courtroom and the judge and jury? I'm a credible witness to what happened while I was sound asleep. The disciples came and stole his body. No, Jesus didn't swoon. No, the disciples didn't come steal his body. He arose. The third proof, as we see the facts stated of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the third proof that substantiates the fact is that he was seen. Look at verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. 
After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. I tell you what a proof Paul's conversion was. A man that was killing Christians. A man that was avid to stamp out this heretical fad of Jesus and this Messiah. And this radical change suddenly in Paul's life. And now it cost him persecution and great suffering, stoning, beatings. Certainly an evidence that God was raised from the dead. He saw him. He said, verse 8, he was seen of me. Any lawyer would love to have these witnesses to parade in front. 500 witnesses, he said in verse 7, or verse 6, from all walks of life, credible people to walk in front and say, we saw him. He arose. He was seen. We have a saying, seen is believing. He was seen. He was seen by his friends, verse 5. Look at it. Seen of Cephas. Who's Cephas? It's Peter. Simon Peter. The one who denied him. In fact, 2 Peter 1.16, this verse is in your bulletin as well. It says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We can picture Peter giving Paul, the writer, human penman of 1 Corinthians, his own private tour of Jerusalem on that first time he would come to Jerusalem after he was converted and Peter taking him to the upper room and say, here's where we sat. Here's where the Lord sat that last supper. Here's where I sat. And here's where Judas sat. And he gave the best piece of bread to Judas and we all trusted Judas. We thought he went out to give money to the poor, but he went to betray him. Jesus warned me that I'd betray him that night, that I would deny him but I argued with him. Then he would take him to Gethsemane. Here's where Jesus prayed and the great drops of blood fell. And here's where Judas came finally to betray him. And I took my sword out and cut off the high priest's servant's ear, Malchus, and Jesus picked it up and put it back on. And here's where finally they arrested our Lord. I can imagine him taking him to the high priest's house, keeping in mind that Paul may have known that house better than Peter did. But here's where I was when I denied him three times. And I went out. He was seen by Peter. Not only that, he was seen by the twelve. Verse 5 it says, In that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. It was a collective term used to talk about the disciples. They would take back I can imagine Paul to the upper room and say, afterwards, we were hiding here. We had the door barred and bolted. We were fearful that they were coming for us next. But suddenly Jesus appeared. He came right through the door. He said, see my hands and my side. It was him. I can imagine the twelve showing him the upper room. Then he was seen by his flock, by 500, it says, above 500, verse 6. After that he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. They're still alive, but some are falling asleep. I can imagine that Paul, before he was Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, had interviewed some of these. I can imagine these were some that were in prison and some that had fallen asleep at Paul's hand, Saul's hand at that time. Any lawyer would love to have these 500 witnesses give their account, eyewitness. Acts 1.3 says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And he was seen by his family. Look at verse number 7. After that he was seen of James. Who is James? Jesus had four half-brothers. At least three half-sisters. James, Joseph, Judas, and uh, let me see here, Simon. Four half-brothers. You know James 
as the writer of the book of James, Hebrew James, Hebrews James, the book of the Bible there, and you know Judas as Jude. No doubt the name Judas, that's why you don't hear it today. Your kids named John, Peter, Paul, not Judas. Yeah, you can imagine why. But that day it was a common name. In fact, two of the disciples were named Judas. His brother was named Judas, but he went by Jude in his writing because of the stigma of that name. But none of his family believed on him until after his resurrection. As far as his brothers and sisters, of course, his mother Mary did. But none of them until James. James, when he believed, that convinced the rest of the family. Then he was seen by his followers, the apostles, verse 8. End of verse 7 and into verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me, his foe, Paul. The 10th of March, said John Newton, is a day much to be remembered by me. For on that day the Lord came on high and delivered me out of deep waters. End of quote. John Newton lost his mother at age 7. His anchor was adrift from that point forward. At age 11 he went to Africa and I quote, he said, here's why I went that I might be free to sin to my heart's content. That's his own words. And he paid a high price for his sin. John Newton fell into pitiless hands. Then he was in the Navy and deserted the Navy and was whipped back with ribbons by the whipping he took. Lucky they didn't hang him. Then he got involved as a wicked man into the atrocities and the just the barbaric behavior of the slave trade. But because of his sin and continuing, he ended up then becoming a slave himself. Going down lower, he became a slave of a slave. In fact, he was bought by a black woman. And he was to depend on his food by what crust you would throw under the table to him. In this state, he was saved in a storm one day. It was a terrible storm. The ship was filling fast with water when John Newton cried out to God for mercy. His first prayer in a long time that he cried to the God of his mother. Before she died at age seven, had taught him about the Lord Jesus. And he cried out for mercy. And he said he sought mercy and found it on March 10th, 1748. He was 23. Of course, he would later write the hymn that you all well, know so well, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, and he was. In fact, it's, he said, it seemed that day, March 10, 1748, the Savior looked into the very depths of my soul, and he wrote this, Sure, never to my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. Of course, John Newton became one of the greatest forces in, for good in the history of the Church of England. Turn that around, and the men that he influenced turned the world around. Thus was Saul of Tarsus, like John Newton. Saul of Tarsus was of savage, bitter hatred. The Bible says of Saul that he wreaked havoc in the church, condemning people to death. He made many a widow. Many Christian family children made orphans by Saul. Here he writes, he says, last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. And this man became the greatest apostle, the greatest missionary, the greatest theologian in church history. And it happened on the Damascus Road. He saw a light from heaven. He saw Jesus. Jesus said to him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And the iron had already began to enter into his soul. Because he saw Stephen die. And he couldn't get away from Stephen's death. When Stephen said, Father, forgive them as they beat his head in with stones. And they saw the glow, a light from another world on his face. And he couldn't get away from it. It was pricking him, God was saying. Jesus said, it's pricking your heart. I know it. And of course, once he saw the Savior, Saul's life, he became Paul. He saw him 
He saw him risen, the risen Savior, as he said. I want you to turn with me to Matthew. We're going to close in Matthew 28. We're through. Matthew chapter 28. Listen to the angels. Verse 5. If you read the first part of Matthew 28, of course, the earthquake happened. The angels descended, rolled back the stone, and they sat on the door. The angels speak here. Verse 6, He is not here, for He is risen as He said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. And behold, He goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see Him, lo, I have told you. Here the action item for you that are Christian here this morning that know Christ is your Savior. You that know if you died at this moment you'd go to heaven. Here's the action item that comes out of the resurrection. Did you see what he said there in verse 6? Come and see. See the proof. He's not here. He is alive. And you'll see him. He's going before you into Galilee. Come and see. But notice he says in verse 7, I'd like you to mark the words, go and tell. Go and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And he said, go quickly. You have an urgent message. You need to tell people that he is alive. He is risen. And you know it because he lives in your heart. You know it because if you know him, you've talked to him. Hopefully today. Tell someone. See, we must not keep the resurrection news to ourselves. It's to be told. Go, tell someone. This is what sets our message apart from all others. See, we don't preach religion. We preach resurrection. Our invitation goes out to men and women, boys and girls, and it's not an invitation to subscribe to some creed. It's an invitation to introduce them to a man who was dead and is alive forevermore, the Lord Jesus Christ. What could be more thrilling than that? Go and tell he's alive. Let's bow and pray.